Hello and welcome to video 20. Here we have a little bit of a precarious situation where it's winter time, you're driving down a road that's got a pretty good steep hill, uh, 10 degrees, which may not sound a lot, but when you're driving that actually is a lot. And we'll assume that you're going 45 miles an hour, which is about 20 meters per second, when you see there's been an accident at the bottom of the hill, as unfortunately happens sometimes in the icy conditions. Now, we want to figure out how long does it take you to stop. What's going to go on here is you have some kinetic energy here that you need to dissipate. You need to get rid of. And the only force you have to do that is friction. This problem gets complicated by two things. One, your coefficient of friction is knocked down to point 0.2 because of the ice. Secondly, because you're going downhill, as you slide forward, you're actually gaining, uh, not gaining, but you're losing gravitational potential energy because you're going lower, and that energy has to go somewhere. So the friction has to get rid of that too. Otherwise, you keep going. Uh, so that can, be, uh, that can be a problem. And then we're going to look at once we figured out that stopping distance, what if you had more normal road conditions and had a really good coefficient of friction like 0.8? How would that change your stopping distance? And then lastly, I'll pull up one of my spreadsheets and we'll look at well, what happens if you uh, play with the coefficient of friction. What if the incline is really steep? What if it's flat? We'll look at some of those kinds of things. But this problem is an energy conservation problem. So what that means is that the total mechanical energy in the beginning. Keep in mind total mechanical energy is the uh, kinetic plus the potential energy. In this case we only have gravitational. There's no spring potential energy or anything else. Plus if you do any non-conservative work like with friction uh, that's going to change the total mechanical energy and you'll have a different final uh, total mechanical energy. So in the beginning we have some kinetic energy that we want to get rid of you have some initial potential energy. We're going to do some non-conservative work, or friction is going to do some non-conservative work. And the kinetic energy final plus the kinetic energy, um, sorry, plus the potential energy final. For those of you who use PE for potential energy, uh, here I'm using F. It's another common way to do it. Now the nice thing, well not for these guys, but the nice thing for you, assuming you don't hit them, is that you're going to stop because you've dissipated all your energy through friction and not because you hit anything else. So what that means is your total mechanical energy at the end here will actually be zero. So what that means is the kinetic energy initial plus the potential energy initial is going to be equal to the negative of the non-conservative work. Now if I start writing these out in variables, kinetic energy, if you recall, is one-half mv squared, so in this case vi. The potential energy is going to be mgh, where this is the h. And the work non-conservative is going to be the friction force, which is going to have a negative value times the distance that you slide down the ramp, d. Now this h, we want to actually express this in terms of d, so there's a little geometry here. So if this is theta, this is your hypotenuse, this is your opposite side, so we can say that the sine of theta is equal to h over d, so I can say that h is equal to d sine of theta. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to plug that in here. So when I rewrite this, you have 1 half mvi squared plus mgh equals. This is going to be positive. Now the friction force, friction equals mu n. And because this is on a ramp, because it's tilted, the normal force is not the same size as the weight force. It's a little different. We have to do mg cosine theta, and I have a video on that, I think it's video 8, if you want to look at forces on a ramp. So when I put that in, we're going to get mu m g d cosine theta. And I just moved the d over here so that the d could go with the g. It's just the way I like to write it. 
But when we look at this, it's kind of convenient in that the mass actually cancels out. So when you first read this problem and said, well, I can't do it. I don't know the mass of the car. You actually don't need the mass of the car. But D is what we want to know. So we need to solve for D. Now this H, we need to take a second and plug this in for there, which we forgot to do. So we're now left with V naught squared over 2 plus G D sine theta equals mu G D cosine theta. And I'm going to bring this over here. So we're going to get V naught squared over 2 equals mu G D times cosine theta minus, I should say mu, GD times mu cosine theta minus sine of theta. So I did two steps there algebraically. I subtracted this over and then I factored out the GD from both sides. So the last thing we want to get is D. So I'm going to take D equals V naught squared over 2 g and then this thing mu cosine theta minus sine of theta and this we can use to get the stopping distance in terms of your initial speed acceleration to gravity the angle of the incline or the angle of the hill and uh, mu the interesting thing about this when you look at this if you saw video 19 it's really the same problem except that there's no friction. I should say except that it's flat. And when it's flat, theta is zero degrees. Notice, minus sine zero degrees. Well, sine of zero is zero. Mu cosine zero degrees. Well, cosine zero is one. So what you wind up with is V naught squared over two mu g. So that's the same answer if this is flat as we got in question 19. So that's a good limiting case behavior. That's a good check that we're, we're doing this correctly. So this is the answer algebraically, but I actually gave you numbers. So when we plug in the numbers, the V here was 20 meters per second uh, over 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared times 0 0.2 uh, times cosine of 10 degrees minus the sine of 10 degrees. And you put all that in, you get a pretty big number. You actually get 875 meters, which is almost half, well, that's just over half a mile. That's a really, really huge stopping distance. And the main reason that that is so large is because you're going downhill and you have a small coefficient of friction. If we repeat this for a mu that is much larger, 0.8, when you plug in, and the only thing that changes is that this goes to 0 0.8 you'll get a stopping distance that's much much more uh, modest you get a mere 33 let me put it in red get a mere 33.5 meters so it's actually quite amazing how much further that is. That's 26 times further when the coefficient of friction goes to 0.8 than when it's for 0.2 on a hill. So let's do one of my favorite things, which is to look in a spreadsheet, because this relationship, this d equals v naught squared over 2g and all that stuff, uh, when you put it in a spreadsheet, you can change the numbers very quickly without having to uh, recalculate. So as you can see, at 45 miles an hour, which is almost 20 meters per second, you get a stopping distance that's around 875 meters. You get a stopping distance of, with a coefficient 0.8 that's much, much more, or much less, rather, 33 and a half. 
what would happen if we went the same speed but there was no incline and we still had a small coefficient of 0.2 it's actually quite amazing how much less of a stopping distance it takes so that 10 degree incline even on ice makes a huge difference it added an extra 700 meters or almost half a mile uh, so doing that makes a huge difference let's see what happens if you double the speed now I don't know why you would want to go 90 miles an hour on an icy road but if you did it would take you three kilometers to stop on that hill which is kind of amusing to think about sorry about the interruption this is actually a lot harder to do uh, at school with people walking in and out of the room so I forget exactly what I was talking about but when you look at the scenario with the, tr the car going down the icy hill the coefficient of friction makes a big difference in the in the stopping distance now if we'd have had a zero degree incline and we quadrupled the coefficient of friction what you would find is that the distance would roughly uh, quarter meaning it would take one-fourth as much because you have one-fourth the force available to stop the car but on an incline it's not that simple because not only do you have to deal with less force friction being able to do work in smaller amounts for a given uh, distance but as you slide down the hill you keep gaining more kinetic energy because you keep losing gravitational potential energy in fact there comes a point at which if the hill is steep enough you will never stop you will just keep sliding forever so with a coefficient of 0.2 at a 5 degree incline alright um, I don't think I'm going to be able to have any continuous thought because people keep coming in so hopefully what I said was coherent and you find it useful and hopefully you'll come back again.